For more than a decade, video games have been relegated to the second dimension. While there had been improvements in graphics such as digitization in games like Mortal Kombat and Donkey Kong Country, true 3D visuals were still out of reach, at least for the cartridge-based game consoles like the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis. Enter Argonaut Software, a UK-based developer who specialized in rudimentary 3D technology. Their goal? Get 3D games running on a Nintendo Game Boy of all systems. They were actually able to pull it off, prompting a swift visit from Nintendo. Impressed with what the young programmers were able to accomplish, the Big N brought Argonaut over to Japan to help Nintendo develop 3D tech for their games. This collaboration resulted in the Super FX chip, a special chip that launched with certain games to improve their graphical capabilities like Yoshi's Island, or to deliver basic polygonal 3D with games like Stunt Race FX. But one of the most influential and important games to ship with the Super FX chip was the revolutionary Star Fox. Star Fox was one of the SNES's biggest hits, shipping over 4 million copies in total, and launching a franchise that would stand alongside Mario, Zelda, and Pokemon for years to come. With the popularity of Star Fox and Nintendo's big 3D console, the Nintendo 64, on the horizon, the timing was just right for the release of one of the best entries in the console's library, Star Fox 64. Released in 1997, Star Fox 64 would be praised by fans and critics alike for its cinematic presentation, gameplay, and structure, making it one of the best-selling games on the console. Mercenary Team Star Fox, comprised of Fox McCloud, Falco Lombardi, Peppy Hare, and Slippy Toad, have to aid the Cornarian army in defeating the evil Andros and his army. It's a typical setup that's elevated by some neat backstory elements and characters. Andros is your comically mad scientist who was exiled but has come back with a vengeance. Peppy was once part of the original Star Fox team, which included Fox's dad, James. Both were betrayed by another member of the team, Pigma Dengar, who was secretly working for Andros. Pigma is now a part of the rival group Star Wolf. Stuff like that. The real enjoyment on this front is from the main cast and their interactions with each other. Star Fox 64 actually has spoken dialogue, and it's not just a few lines here or there. Almost 700 voice samples were recorded for Star Fox 64, making it a rarity for a Nintendo game. The voice acting is deliciously campy and over the top. While it can be cringy at times, there's some great lines which endears you to these characters even more. Peppy is the wise veteran who tries to constantly provide advice to the team. Slippy is the goofball always getting into shenanigans. Whoa! Help me! Thanks, Fox! Falco is the quick-witted hotshot. Go find your own target, Fox! And Fox is the sarcastic yet stoic leader of the group. I see him up ahead. Let's rock and roll! While they are one note, their banter makes for some entertaining interactions during levels. Same thing goes for the rival group Star Wolf. Fox and Wolf are very similar, having this light versus dark dynamic. Leon is the posh uppity pilot, with Pigma being his brash opposite of sorts. Then there's Andros's cousin, Andrew. Bow before the great Andros. I really hate Andrew. Star Wolf, while not having as much screen time as the main cast, are a great group of antagonists you love to hate. There's a reason why Fox, Falco, and Wolf all made it to the roster of Super Smash Bros. As shallow and one note as their characterizations might be, they're still fun characters with great designs that stand the test of time, making them classic Nintendo characters. Gameplay-wise, Star Fox is very much in a genre of its own. It's this hybrid of rail shooter games like Sin and Punishment, House of the Dead, Time Crisis, or Virtua Cop, and shoot 'em up games like Space Invaders, Gradius, Life Force, or Ikaruga. The closest comparisons would probably be something like Space Harrier on the Sega Genesis, the Panzer Dragoon series, or most closely resembling Factor V's Rogue Squadron games. Gameplay in Star Fox 64 is very much arcade-like, flying through a stage, grabbing power-ups, taking out any resistance in your way, maneuvering through obstacles, and keeping your squad alive until the very end where you take on a boss. Most stages have you constantly moving forward, with the only thing the player has to be cognizant about is their positioning on the screen. Flying an R-Wing feels great, with just the right amount of weight to feel tangible in the game world and nimble enough to dodge incoming fire or fly around obstacles. Obstacles. There's something inherently enjoyable about flying around a 3D space. It's why the original SNES title was such a big hit, and with the updated graphics and speed of the N64, Star Fox 64 is the definitive Star Fox experience in that regard. Flying isn't the only part of why Star Fox 64 is so great in my eyes. Star Fox's level design is almost like an obstacle course of sorts. With the player on a track most of the time, enemies and obstacles are set up specifically to test players' skills. There's a number of different variables during your typical Star Fox level that have to be taken into account. The basics of enemies flying away, towards, or in front of you and blowing them out of the sky is as simple as it is enjoyable. Mashing the fire button at ships or enemies as they approach or while dodging incoming fire is always this fun reflex test. There's power-ups in the form of bombs and laser upgrades. Bombs are great for taking out groups of enemies or dealing massive damage to bosses. Bombs are finite throughout a level, so there's always that decision of when to use them or wanting to save them just in case. Laser upgrades buff your damage as well as allow you to fire faster, which can be key in taking down enemies that require more than one hit to defeat. These upgrades also can heal your ship. In Star Fox 64, 
taking damage during a level can result in your R wing actually taking physical damage. Getting clipped by enemy fire or running into obstacles in the environment can cause you to lose one or both of your ship's wings. This isn't just a neat visual detail, as it also translates to gameplay. Losing your left or right wing will cause the R wing to dip or drift to that side. Losing both wings can cause the R wing to slowly lose altitude. This forces the player to constantly readjust their position, creating a more difficult experience. Any damage sustained will require regenerating your health. Health is gained by flying through silver or golden rings, which is a fantastic design choice. Flying through silver rings increases your health slowly. Grabbing three golden rings will not only gain back more health, but will also increase your max health during that life. Golden rings are always placed in a position that requires some tricky flying or maneuvering, so going after them is a risk first reward scenario. Same thing goes for silver rings, as making a beeline towards some extra health might put you into the line of fire or in the oncoming path of some obstacles. Buildings, asteroids, or cliff sides round out the obstacles in the environment players have to dodge or fly through. These can be either stationary, like arches or rocks, or active, like debris floating out in space. These aren't as deadly as enemy fire, but they are threats nonetheless, and dealing with them can be just as fun as blowing said enemies out of the sky. Players have several different maneuvers they can pull off in the R-Wing. Typical moves like slowing down to have tailing foes speed by you, or boosting and catching up to enemies trying to escape. The R-Wing can also tip in either direction to squeeze through tight gaps, or of course you can do a barrel roll to dodge or deflect enemy projectiles. Where everything really comes together are in the boss battles. In my opinion, they're some of the most fun in the game, as they're a focused challenge utilizing Star Fox core mechanics. You're reading attack patterns, dodging fire, or counterattacking, they're a blast. While the main gameplay typically revolves around 3D scrolling levels, there's tweaks to the formula that add some variety to playthroughs. All range mode opens up the battlefield and allows players to fly around in 360 degrees. These are used mostly for boss battles or climaxes to levels. I will admit it can be a bit tricky getting the hang of having so much freedom, but when you're dogfighting Star Wolf or taking out robot bosses, it can feel great. Blowing away a ship that's chasing a teammate or looping back around and getting the drop on an enemy is tons of fun. It employs the same style of gameplay but from a new perspective and shakes the formula up just enough as to not get repetitive. Similar to all range mode sections, additional vehicles besides the R-Wing were included. These share the same 3D scrolling style of gameplay but either put the player on the ground in the Landmaster tank or underwater in the Blue Marine sub. Like the R-Wing, the Landmaster controls great but is given its own unique feel. Being a tank, it's relegated to the ground. Players still have access to lasers and bombs as well as maneuvers and hover abilities to dodge obstacles. There's something just so cool about firing away at enemies on the ground as your teammates cover you from the air. The Blue Marine is probably the worst vehicle objectively, but that's not to say it's bad. Just like the Landmaster and R-Wing before it, the submarine has its own controls tailored to making it feel like as if you were piloting a vehicle underwater. It feels more floaty than the other two vehicles, gaining momentum as you propel yourself in any direction. To compensate for the movement, it's outfitted with infinite torpedoes that lock on to almost anything. Just like all range mode in the R-Wing, these sections are enjoyable as they add a new twist or perspective to the core gameplay mechanics. While they're the minority in the level selection, they're as enjoyable as the R-Wing sections in my opinion. What makes Star Fox 64 special is its mission structure. A typical playthrough of Star Fox 64 will take players on seven missions, starting on Corneria and ending on Venom to take out Andros. Depending on how the player completes a level will determine which path the player can take. There's three main routes, an easy, medium, and hard route, culminating in 25 possible route combinations when playing through Star Fox 64. The stipulations surrounding which path players can take differ from level to level. For example, in Macbeth, the boss at the end can be bypassed almost entirely if the player hits all eight switches towards the end of the level, which will take them to Area 6. Missing the switches will force the players to defeat the boss, which takes them to Bolse. Or in Sector Y, if the player can defeat a total of 100 enemies by the end of the level, they will be taken to Aquas to take on the bioweapon under the sea. If not, they travel to Katina to aid a friendly squad. This multiple pathway structure also affects the story as well. For example, in Sector X, if the player takes too long to defeat the boss, it will take out Slippy's R wing causing him to crash land on the planet Titania. Or if the player reaches Zonus via Aquas, Cat, a love interest of Falco, will show up in Macbeth to help with the switches I mentioned earlier. Another aspect that plays into this feature is your squad. Your squad all has a health bar and can usually take care of themselves, but there are times they'll be in danger and need assistance. If they take too much damage, they'll retreat back to the Great Fox and be absent for the rest of the level as well as the following level as their R wing gets repaired. This is a neat mechanic as most levels or bosses are easier the more squad mates you have. They can draw fire away from Fox or attack enemies throughout the stage. Slippy is the most important in this regard as he has the ability to analyze bosses' shields, displaying its health bar during the battle. No Slippy, no health bar, making it tricky to gauge how much damage you're actually doing. While they don't do much, there is a difference. Trust me, there's a disparity between facing Star Wolf with a full squad versus alone. This doesn't just affect difficulty as it also has an effect on the path you take through the campaign. For example, if Falco is forced to retreat in Corneria, you miss your opportunity to take the hard path to Sector Y. The campaign is such a dynamic experience and pretty impressive for an over 20 year old game. Some can blaze through Star Fox in just over an hour, and that'd be effectively skipping 80% of the game. Replayability is the cornerstone of Star Fox 64's enjoyment. This ties back
back into its arcade-like structure. Short, fun bursts of gameplay you play over and over and over again to reach a new stage or path or beat your high score. To get the most out of Star Fox 64 requires multiple playthroughs, honing your skills and taking different pathways through the campaign. Levels might be short, anywhere from 5 to 10 minutes long, but they're packed to the brim with action. Some of my favorites have to be Solar and Area 6. Solar, being a molten lava planet, has extremely high temperatures which causes the hull of the R-Wing to take damage over time. It's this tense race to the finish as you constantly look out for health and are on edge more than ever not to take any unnecessary damage. Area 6 is a massive space battle against Andross's forces. It's this epic assault as you and your squad push through Andross's defenses, taking on waves upon waves of ships and missiles, blowing away countless enemies, calling in the Great Fox to aid in the assault as Andross's army scrambles to try to hold Star Fox back. It's probably the best level in the game as the gameplay and story merge in this cinematic climax. The one aspect of Star Fox 64 that can't reach the quality of its gameplay and level structure is its soundtrack, oddly enough. The legend Koji Kondo composed Star Fox 64's music, and it's not great. Not bad per se, just inconsistent. There's some killer tracks here, like Area 6, or the boss battle themes. Then there's tracks like Corneria, and it just sounds off. It doesn't detract from the enjoyment of the game when you're in the zone, but it rarely adds to it. It's one of the only areas Star Fox 64 could improve upon as the rest of the game is a joy. Growing up, the N64 was the first game console that I truly remember adoring. I had played games prior to that on the Sega Genesis or Super Nintendo, but the advent of 3D technology blew my mind. The big three that I hold near and dear to me is Ocarina of Time, Super Mario 64, and Star Fox 64. Going back to these titles 20 plus years later with a more well-rounded objective eye has shown a less than flattering light on some of my most adored childhood memories, but I gotta say, Star Fox 64 holds up extremely well. It's the definitive Star Fox experience, so much so Nintendo has been remaking it constantly over the past 20 years. Star Fox 64 is the epitome of fun in my opinion. Its fast, frenetic gameplay excites, and its innovative level structure creates near endless replayability. It's a game that not only holds up, but also manages to top any future attempts in the series. It might just be one of Nintendo's best games on not only the N64, but of all time. It's the title that shows the potential of the series, and cements its place in history as one of Nintendo's most important and beloved franchises.